So now he's like even bigger mad. <laughs> it's sarah welcome back to another video here on my channel today we are jumping into the second half of the tandem read for the throne of glass series so we're going over the ending of empire of storms and uh tower of dawn all at once if you guys are enjoying this series don't forget to subscribe just so you don't miss any updates i am planning to finish kingdom of ash and then i'm looking for another series to do next so drop your recommendations down below because i'd love to keep doing books on top of my tv shows if i can i just want to do like a general trigger warning as we move on to the ending of Throne of Glass because the ending of these two books and then also um, Kingdom of Ash, the last book kind of in general, it's just going to get very violent and there's a lot of like really upsetting subject material that we're going to be getting into. So just like know that in your hearts as we move forward. But okay, let's get into it. So okay, meeting back up with the gang in Skull's Bay, Aelin is basically like propositioning Rolf and being like, I know you're the heir to the lost Mycenaean people, which are basically like Atlanteans. You can kind of think of them same, similar, like water people, there's sea dragons involved. It's very interesting, but we don't learn a whole lot about them. <laughs> she wants them to like rise up again under Rolf's influence and join her army. And then if he agrees to do that, she's gonna give him back Ilium, which is the whole reason why they went there to that specific temple and she like freed the city. Rolf at first is like, um, you're insane. The Mycenaeans are all dead that's not true i'm not their heir but like he's lying he's lying this man is a liar this man is a mycenaean he's a liar all of a sudden a warning bell goes off and rolf realizes that the city is under attack and he immediately blames aelin and he's like you sent out that like weird flicker of power and you summoned the freaking bald creatures that were staying on the coast and aelin's like mm, why would I do that? Like she absolutely, that's exactly what she did, okay? Earlier when she did it, Rowan made up an excuse and was like, my lady has to like release some of her magic or she'll explode. And Ralph was like, oh, okay. But now he knows, like she did this on purpose. Dorian also knows she lied and he's just like, she's so sneaky. I love her so much. We love a supportive bestie king, okay? Like he, he never gives her any shit for being terrible. <laughs> Realizing that they're gonna lose because Aelin and the group are like, peace out, Rolf, have fun with your attack. We gotta go since you're not helping us. Rolf is like, okay, 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 I changed my mind. I changed my mind. If you will make me a lord, I will in fact help you. Okay, yes, I'll join the war. And she says he can be lord of like Skull's Bay and be like lord of the pirates on top of being head of the Mycenaeans and he agrees. Everybody starts gearing up to fight Lysandra turns into a sea dragon. Her and Aelin have been like um, studying like the history and stuff and she's always a little bit involved in Aelin's plans and we don't find that out in the moment but there's always little hints that like she's helping Aelin with something behind the scenes. She turns into a sea dragon though specifically to like prove to Rolf and his people that if the Mycenaeans come back the sea dragons will come back which is like part of their legends. It's a lie but like it works. So Dorian's staying at a watchtower to do magic from there because she doesn't want him going into the battle directly and both of them risking getting hurt because somebody has to stay to like lead the continent. Yeah, and Aelin is going directly into the center of the fleet because she's insane. The ensuing fight on the ship has Aelin like going really deeply down into her power, but then also like channeling Rowan's through their bond that they have. So she uses all of hers and then she's taking his so that she can hopefully like explode, you know, most of the ships, that's the goal, in one shot. What ends up happening though is the word key is around her neck in the amulet and one of the gods, Deanna, like uses this moment of her being so like vulnerable in her power and like not really present in her body to like sneak in through the word key and like use it as a gate and take over Aelin's body. So she does in fact destroy the ships 
but she also almost like just obliterates Skull's Bay because the goddess takes over and is like using her power. Rowan says it looks like moon fire, but the flames are silver. And I had not made that connection to Nesta until this reread. And I was like, oh, silver flint, interesting. The only reason why she stops and is able to like get control of her body again is because Rowan throws himself in front of her and she can't hurt him. Interesting. Vienna, while she was in her body, also like took all of Rowan's power. So Rowan is basically like completely drained in this moment and he's powerless, but she doesn't hurt him. And she ends up kind of like self imploding. And so the ship explodes and everybody ends up in the water, which is really bad because the Vogue ships have freaking like sea wyverns. So like Abraxas and stuff that they've been flying around up in the air, they got sea ones and they are in the water ready to attack. Fenris though jumps in and saves Aelin because she's basically like unconscious and confused and like not able to swim properly because of what had just happened to her. So he gets her and he's like, don't worry, I have you, you're gonna be okay. We've gotta swim, okay, we've gotta get out. And he's like helping her along because Rowan already got out of the water and it, it's just so cute. Also, Fenris can freaking teleport like Cormac and Reese. I have so many questions. While they're getting out of the water and this is happening for them over near the ships, Lysandra is still in sea dragon form and she's swimming around either like ripping the hulls of the ships apart or attacking the sea wyverns. It gets really intense because obviously she's a magic wielder, but in the sense that like she's a shapeshifter, but she has to use her power to stay in her form. And then also she has the strength of the creature she has, but not like, full capacity is the way it's always been described. Like she starts to get tired quicker than the actual creature she's pretending to be would. So these giant sea wyverns come after her because she killed their babies. So they're like triple the size of the ones that she's already killed and they start chasing her through the water and it gets so intense. This is such an epic fight scene. I hope the person that commented that said like, um, can SJM do battles? sees this video because like, bro, I'm gonna answer your comment. We're gonna talk about it. But like the Throne of Glass fights, they're so good. So Lysandra ends up taking one of them out by herself. And then she tricks one of them into getting too close to Dorian. And he like freezes it for her and then is able to like shatter it. So two of them are gone. There's just one more left, but she is bloody and exhausted and dying. It's really scary. She's trying to like fight as fast as she can and swim as fast as she can. And Adian is like, oh, hell no. He's freaking out in the other watchtower, losing his mind because he can't really do anything. He doesn't have any magic. He's just really strong and kind of fast. So he's up in the watchtower, like holding the harpoon gun, trying to like mind meld and get her to come closer to him and she senses it and is like okay I can do it and so she drags the other one closer and Adian is able to save her and it is incredible. She ends up on the beach still in her sea dragon form because now she's too tired to shift back into a human. All the men that are like with them on the shore try to help and she's like snapping at them and like throwing her tail at them because she's scared. So Adian comes up to her and is like, hey man, you, you gotta calm down. We have to be able to get close enough to you so we can heal you, okay? You gotta relax. And she's at first like, yeah, I'm a dragon, I'll eat you. And he's like, can you not? Because if you eat me, how are we gonna get married one day? And she's like, oh. <laughs> So she relaxes enough for him to like sit with her and heal her a little bit. And then we get this sweet scene of Gavriel like watching him from the like shoreline. And Adian just sits with her and sits with her and sits with her until she finally has enough strength to like shift back into a human. He wraps her up in his cloak and carries her home. They are everything to me, your honor. We also get this nice moment while they're on the beach and Lysandra is still in sea dragon form of Aelin just like losing her mind, like apologizing. I mean, she feels 
so guilty that Lysandra had to push herself so much and she's so proud of her but also just like devastated. So again if you watched my CC3 video and now you're here, Aelin doesn't gamble with her court. Like she asks them to do things and then when they get hurt, oh man, it like eats her alive in a way that Bryce Quinlan just does not understand. <laughs> Aelin and Rowan meet with Rolf after the battle and he is kind of at a loss for words over how truly powerful Aelin is and the fact that like she so easily like lost control but he also is like I agreed to help you so I'm gonna help you and we're gonna win the war and then he like opens up to them and talks about his map on his hands and he says that the cost of getting it inked and like having it work was the greatest treasure that he had. And he thought that was gonna mean like money or like he was gonna lose out on something. And instead his mom and sister were killed. So that's so sad. <laughs> My God, it's so good, okay? Rowan and Aelin walk down the beach together because she is kind of spiraling and she's very upset by what happened, but also the fact that like she almost hurt him and just all of this stuff, like all, it's just emotions all over the place. They end up getting it on in the sand and it is just everything to me. They end up hooking up in the sand. And while I hate the fact that they're like in the sand, it's the best scene ever. She literally lights herself on fire. And because Rowan has ice and wind magic, he's able to like keep up with her. It's incredible. Okay, neither one of them have ever been with somebody that has like an equal match to their power. It's like they're, they're having a great time. They truly 10 out of 10. If you haven't read this scene before, you need to read it. Also, we will not get another one like this. Okay, I don't know if she got in trouble or what, but this is like several pages of this scene, okay? And then moving forward, we're gonna get like two paragraphs, a sentence. It's very upsetting, but this scene, it makes up for it. It's the only one like this in like the whole book series because even the, the Dorian ones are not this detailed, but oh my God, it's so good. Also, this is when they finally say I love you to each other. It's so precious. She even gives him a little bit of an out and she's like, I know you've been hurt before. You don't have to say it back. Like, I don't need anything more than you can give me. And he's like, girl, you can have everything. They are just, oh, they're so cute together. Once the group gets back together, Aelin basically tells them everything about the keys and then Elena appears to them and she explains that the lock for the keys is in a marsh at the center of a temple. The lock is what Elena and Gavin use to like seal Erewhon up and everything. So that's how Aelin is hopefully gonna be able to use it to defeat him again. Also, we find out that freaking Mala, like the firebringer goddess herself, is Elena's mother. Get it, Brandon, like we see you. Also, we get further confirmation that Dorian and Aelin are cousins. So enjoy that. They take off on a ship headed for the stone marshes and then they see freaking Abraxas riding into them and Manon is on his back and Dorian is like, whoa, 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 nobody fire because immediately Fenris is like, um, that's a witch and a freaking dragon, kill it on sight. And everybody starts like aiming their weapons at her and Dorian's like, no, no. <laughs> This means that when Manon told Abraxas, head to the coast, somewhere safe, Abraxas said, you mean your future husband and the king of Adderlon? You got it, babes. I'll get you to him stat. Manon is still knocked out though. And when Abraxas kind of banks and gets nervous seeing everybody about to fire on him, she falls off the saddle and into the water. And would you like to take a guess who jumps in to quickly get her out? We don't actually see it on page, but yeah. Yeah, Dorian jumped in and got her out. Then we hard cut over to Elodie and Lorcan who are still on their way. They're now performing with the carnival. She is doing like tarot and fortune telling. She's lying completely, but that's what she's doing. And then Lorcan is taking off his shirt, oiling up his body and like flipping his weapons around. Things are starting to heat up between the two of them because she's wearing makeup and Lorcan's like, wow. She looks so pretty with red lipstick on and he's just sweaty and really tall and hot. Like everybody is so into him that a farmer's wife buys his sweaty shirt from him after the show. 
do with that information what you will. They have a cute moment where Lorcan asks like why she hasn't been with anybody before because there's lots of people that are like hitting on them at the carnival and Elodie is like well you're supposed to be my husband like we would get in trouble if I hooked up with random boys and he's like oh okay so like are you just not interested in dudes like do you like women more? And he's so chill about it. And Elodie's like, no, but actually, you know what? I don't actually know because I've never been with anybody before. And Lurkin's like, oh, ever? <laughs> Small side note, there's such a weird difference between the way sexuality is handled in Throne of Glass and even Akatar. I don't understand why. Throne of Glass and, um, Crescent City, there's like secondary characters that are queer that we meet that she doesn't ever really write anybody that's like the main character. She just doesn't. But she'll put other people in and they're secondary, but they're happy and they're in good relationships and like everything seems fine. And then in Akatar, there's all this weird homophobia that comes out. And I'm like, why are the Prithian Fae? so weird about it when the other ones in the other two worlds are like fairly chill and sexuality doesn't seem to matter at all. What's going on in Akatar that's got them all like wound up about it? I don't, does anybody have any theories about that? Because in this reread I like picked up on it again where I was like, yeah, nobody seems to care about sexuality in Throne of Glass. Like even Lorcan, who is like very judgmental about literally everything else is like, oh, you, you maybe like girls? That's fine. I don't mind at all. Then demons attack for Marath, and so Lorcan tells Elodie to hide. She is staying in, like, the underneath part of, like, one of the caravan wagons. He goes out and fights them and finds out that her name is Elodie. So remember this whole time he thought her name was Marion, which is her mom's name because she lied to him. And now he's like, mmm, that little bitch. But he still doesn't turn her in. He just ends up, like, sneaking back into the caravan where she's hiding and, like, waiting for her to come out and then being like, what would you do if I was one of the demons, you stupid little human girl? And she's like, okay, well, thank God you're not. Jesus. So he's big mad. But she tells him that he's lying to her, too. So, like, yes, they both kept secrets. Relax. What's the big deal? And he's like, man. I love it when you talk back to me. I love that you're not afraid. So they end up like sharing secrets about their past and basically like giving each other like brief history rundowns of what they've been through. Then they bond over like not having any real family or friends left in the world. But yeah, mostly it's just like a nice moment of her being like, you're not gonna intimidate me even though you're three feet taller than I am. And he's like, I love that I can't intimidate you even though I'm three feet taller than you are. This is the best day of my life. Manon wakes up in the ship in a bed, like in her own little room, but she's chained up. Aelin is there watching her. Aelin's like, girl, if you run or hurt anybody on this crew, I will personally kill you myself. Are we understood? And Manon's like, yeah, that's fine. The next time she wakes up though, Dorian is there watching her. She trusts him the most because of course she does. So she tells him the truth about everything that happened. They knew she got attacked by at least like an iron teeth witch because she had like little iron shards in her stomach when Rowan and Aelin were healing her wounds. But she tells Dorian like the truth of it and is like, yeah, 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 my grandma, she's evil. <laughs> She wants him to find the 13 for her. And he realizes that like, she doesn't even know if they're alive at this moment. And he's like, yeah, okay, absolutely. I'll do whatever I can do. I'll find out what I can find out. The fact that Dorian is not even like the tiniest bit afraid of her, like even when she like lightly teases that she's hungry and so maybe she could drink his blood, he's kind of into it. And that just does it for her. She's like, I don't know what's going on with this crazy freaking prince man, but I want him in my bed immediately. And Dorian's like, not yet, you're still healing, but yes. Elodie and Lorcan are stopped in a new town and they start going like tavern to tavern trying to get information about where Aelin might be. The carnival people freaking turn them in because after the fight with the demons, they realized that Lorcan was like a little too skilled with his weapons and Elodie maybe matches the description of the like girl that the demons were looking for. So they give them up because they suck. Thankfully though, Lorcan is fey and very old, so he hears them coming and quickly like grabs Elodie and they get on a boat and leave. The captain of the boat 
like reluctantly agrees to help them and Elodie's like, he said he would help us. We don't need to kill him. Lorcan is like, go into the cabin and be quiet. If anybody sees you, we're gonna get caught. So she does as she's told. And then of course he kills the captain anyway, which really upsets her and they get into another fight, even though he is just trying to keep them safe. And so he knows that they were turned on by the carnival people and those people were their friends. So a random captain guy is absolutely gonna turn on them for the promise of money. Lorcan gets a weird like magic tingle and he checks the amulet that Aelin gave him and finds a note that basically says better luck next time, idiot. Cause remember she gave him a fake word key. So now he's like even bigger mad. <laughs> And he ends up telling Elodie, basically like screaming it at her, that Selena and Aelin are the same person. So her beloved queen is actually like an evil, cold-hearted assassin. She tells him that she's changed her mind and he's actually alone because he's hateful and grumpy and that's why nobody likes him. He refuses to let her go alone even though she like wants to leave the boat because he did promise to protect her. So now they're just both heading to Elloway because they think that that's where Aelin is going. That's like all the information they got from the tavern points to Elloway, but they don't know what she's doing there. Aelin is having wild dreams because her anxiety after the whole situation with Deanna taking her over is just getting worse and worse. And she keeps accidentally setting herself on fire in her sleep. Thankfully though, Rowan is there and like I said, he's got ice and wind powers. So he's able to like cool her down and also like take away the oxygen so that the fire goes out, but it's not great. Like she keeps setting things on fire and nearly hurting him in the process. So then they end up banging again, but y'all they're on the ship, okay? And the walls are thin. And unlike in Akatar, they don't ever really like shield the room. So we can assume that people can hear them. And even if they can't hear them, they send out weird bursts of magic at certain points in the scene. I'm sure you can guess when. So the whole ship is just like, whoa, magical people are having sex somewhere in the vicinity. <laughs> There's a really cute moment in this scene of Rowan getting like overly protective because of his like fey instincts. And he apologizes and is like, I know it gets on your nerves. Like, I'm sorry, I'm trying to control it. Like I I'm trying not to do anything because he, he definitely like has the most control out of the boys in the SJM universe where he knows Aelin doesn't like it. So he tries to like tampen down that part of himself. But Aelin in this moment is like, Rowan, sweetie, you're not not human like I'm not gonna expect you to be human I know I pick on you but like I love you and it's okay that you react this way I'm not mad I just really love how they see each other so completely and like nothing that the other one does is ever like too much they're just they're so in love and they're so perfect together help I said everybody on the ship felt that weird magic burst yeah Dorian goes to Manon's room and he's like girl was that you what the heck was that and she's like no actually witches don't have magic that way and she once again I think that I've already explained it to you guys because we learned about it already but she explains the yielding to Dorian which is basically like at the end of a witch's life they can like implode and take out surrounding areas near them with their magic. It's like a last burst of it, but they don't have like elemental stuff the way like Dorian and Aelin and Rowan have. So she starts trying to seduce him into taking off her chains. And he's like, girl, do you think I'm an idiot? The answer is yes, but also I see what you're doing. She starts using her charms on him to be like, don't you wanna take me out of these chains so I can have my way with you? Like, don't you wanna, don't you wanna ask me to kiss you and stuff like that? And Dorian goes, I will never beg again for anything in my life. And you're like, oh, so submissive Dorian has left the building, noted. And Manon is sitting there like, okay, I've never been denied by a man in my entire life. Certainly not a mortal man. Who does this guy think he is? And why is it so hot? Dorian goes outside the room, takes a breather in the hallway and then comes back in. This time though, he is like stupidly intense and Manon is eating it up. She's like, whatever's going on with that feral, unhinged look in his eyes, I'm here for it. And I'm like, girl, we get each other. Manon and I, she's, she's just like me. <laughs> he uses his freaking shadow hands for the first time, which just sends Manon into orbit. But then after he's got her like all wound up, he just goes, maybe another night, witchling and leaves the room. And Manon is like, 
what have I gotten myself into? And I'm like, girl, you don't even know. You don't even know what is coming for you. That man is insane. The next day though, Dorian goes to Aelin and he convinces her to like release Manon. So she's gotta have a guard on her at all times, but she doesn't have to be chained up anymore. However, when they go down to do that, Fenris follows them and Manon is like, who is that man? And Rowan and Dorian are like, that is Fenris. He is our friend. Sort of. He also kind of wants to kill Lorcan, but it's complicated. And Manon goes, yeah, that's not your friend Fenris. I don't know who that guy is. And then he shapeshifts into a freaking demon. So it's that same bloodhound that tracked her in the woods and it's been sent to bring her back to Erewhon. They end up like fighting through the ship and then Dorian pins it down so that Manon can kill it easier. And when she gets close enough, the bloodhound starts teasing her and throws her like a scrap of leather, which is Astrin's like leather hair tie that they all wear on the ends of their braids. So it looks like Astrin has been killed and Manon is so like shocked and scared by this that she can't like raise her sword to do the killing blow. So Dorian does it for her with his shadow hand magic. He doesn't even use his own hands. He doesn't move from her side. He just reaches out with his scary shadow hands and snaps the creature's neck. Manon is furious, but Dorian's like, I didn't like the way she talked to you. I will not be apologizing for my actions. The gang also finds out from the demon that Manon is a croaking witch. So that's very surprising for all involved. More demons come. And thankfully Manon is out, so they're able to like fight them off together. But everyone gets their shit rocked. Like these demons are getting stronger and stronger each time they fight them. Fenris in particular, I think he gets swiped with claws and not teeth, but the demons are like poisonous. So his wounds on his stomach are really bad and he's dying. Thankfully, Aelin's able to heal him though because she's been working on her healing magic. Also Gabriel's there, so he's helping. We also learn in this moment that no one knows where his teleportation powers come from. SJM, I am quite literally begging you to tell me if Reese's last name is Moonbeam. Like, just confirm that these people are connected or not connected because I'm dying. They also find out from the demons that are attacking that Erwin knows that uh, Aelin has another word key. So that is bad, bad, bad. We then learn that Fenris hates being bloodsworn to Maeve and Gavriel loved it because he loves honor and that's like his big thing is that he's like an honorable male so he enjoyed working for Maeve and serving her and being in her court uh, but then he fell in love with Adian's mom and that's the only time he's ever hated the blood oath because he didn't know how to like be in both places at once he reveals to Adian and the gang that the only reason why he left Adian's mom was because she begged him to because she was afraid of Maeve finding either Adian or Aelin. He wanted to stay and be a family and he would have loved getting to raise Adian himself. So this is very upsetting and it's just happening above Fenris who is bleeding out on the deck of the ship. They start slowly making their way to Elaway even though now they're all vaguely injured and like slowly healing up again. Dorian and Manon talk about how cool his shadow powers are. She's forgiven him for making that killing blow because even though it was annoying, she understands why he did it. She tells him that he doesn't need to worry about being monsters like the rest of them because right now Dorian is feeling like, um, does he enjoy killing or does he kill because he has to? And he feels like he's over here in the like, I do it only when I have to do it. Whereas Manon and the others kind of like it. So she's like, you don't have to worry about that. You're never gonna be like that because you're good, Dorian, and you're always gonna be good. She reminds him that she's not human and so he needs to remember that when they're together. And he's like, yes, girl, why do you think I like you so much? Human women are too breakable for me now. And that is like a knife to the heart. So Manon in the moment is like, oh, hot and sexy. But then also she's like, why are your eyes so sad though? Because obviously he's thinking about Sorsha and we know that, but he hasn't told Manon about her yet. So upsetting. After learning that Manon is Crokin Queen or whatever, Aelin and her bond a little bit over the fact that they're like reluctant queens basically and also very, very badass women. Aelin asks her if witches could ever see the future and Manon confirms that like, yeah, some of the elders could, but it's not really a power that the younger ones have now. Aelin gets upset by this because at this point Fenris has said that in regards to like Maeve and would she ever back down from the blood oaths and would she ever stop the war, he's like, no, nameless is her price, which is what Baba Yellowlegs said to Aelin. So 
she has a freak out and ends up running to her room and throwing up. Rowan is of course like, whoa, you, what's happening? Are you okay? What's going on? And she says, I don't want to talk to you right now. Get me Lysandra. And he listens, even though he's like, you don't want to talk to me? Okay. Rowan also has a little internal monologue of like, oh my God, I got her pregnant. Oh, we're in the middle of a war. This is my nightmare. But I'm just going to tell you right now, that's, she's not pregnant. That's not what's happening. This is one of my favorite scenes from this book. Elodie and Lorcan have to stop for supplies, so they pull into port at this random town and they go in and they have to separate. So they're in different parts, gathering different supplies. While Elodie is like leaving her shopping supply run, she gets freaking turned in by the shopkeeper and Vernon shows up and kidnaps her. He takes her to one of the evil little iron boxes that Erwin loves to use and he's gonna put her in it and then have her be carried by the scary little demons, which are called Ilkin. I don't think I told you that. The scary little demons are called Ilkin, okay? They are gonna carry the box back to Marath and Elodie's like, absolutely not. I will not be doing that. Vernon in this moment is also like, Lorcan left you alone. We saw him leave the city. So don't think for a second that that stupid idiot Faye is gonna come save you. And Elodie is just crushed. Lord Lorcan, meanwhile, realized she wasn't coming back and he's like, oh, okay, something's wrong. I have to go find my silly little human girl. So he goes racing off and finds her just in time to watch Vernon say that, that like he left her and he's not coming for her. And then he watches in horror as she grabs the knife from Vernon's like belt and goes to stab it into her own chest. Thankfully, because he's there, he's able to like stop the blade and they're able to like fight their way back to the boat and escape. Vernon does not die though, he gets away. Lorcan is initially like really angry with her for trying to like hurt herself. And then he realizes, oh, you believed him. Like you thought I left you. And she's like, yeah, everybody leaves. And he's like, girl, I promised you I would protect you. I will always come for you. I promise. And it's so sweet because do you remember when she was in the dungeon in Marath and she was thinking to herself that like nobody was gonna find her because nobody cares and nobody ever comes for her. And I told you guys that we just had to wait and that was gonna come back. It's back, here it is. I can't. So on the boat traveling to the specific area of this like stone marshes, they see Elloway from the coast and it's burning. traveling to the specific area of this like stone marshes, they see Elloway from the coast and it's burning. Aelin knows that Maeve is just doing it for fun. So her and Rowan work together to like put the fires out as best they can, even though they can't go into port. Rowan asks her if she's pregnant and she says no, but she doesn't tell him what's really going on. She like starts to, and then she gets cut off. Manon has to send Abraxas away because once they get to the marshes, he's too conspicuous on the boat. And she's like, buddy, you gotta go. You gotta go somewhere else, lie low for a little bit, then come back to me when you can. He doesn't want to, obviously. So it's one of those horrible moments where she's like, go, get out of here. I don't want you. But obviously she's lying. It's, it made me cry. It's really sad. Then Manon throws the red cloak that she wears that was from her sister that she killed without knowing it was her sister. She throws it into the water because she doesn't want it anymore as a symbol of like hurting the Krokens and dividing the two clans. Aelin watches her do this and then says to her, you never stop seeing their faces. And it's again another bonding moment where they realize that like they've both taken a lot of lives, some of them that they wish they hadn't have taken. to Tower of Dawn. Did you miss those guys? I missed Sartok and Nesrin. We're thankfully starting with them. When Sartok and Nesrin come home with Falcon, he's pretty upset that Haloon knew that Falcon was a shapeshifter but didn't tell him. Because remember, a lot of people don't trust shapeshifters. So that was upsetting for him, but he's working on it. Haloon has more stories for them and ends up telling them about like the word keys and stuff. Nesrin obviously knows what she's talking about and has kind of an intense reaction to it. So when she leaves the fire that night, Sartok follows her. And he's like, that's what's going on, isn't it? Tell me the truth. 
He wants to know if Erwin already has the word keys and if that's why the war is so bad. She doesn't give him a direct answer because they still aren't like technically on the same side and she doesn't completely trust him. But she says that she hopes now he understands why they need his father's help so badly. Kale is now gaining a bunch of strength in his legs. He still can't walk fully, but he's got like a lot of movement again. So his new routine is basically like get up and train with the soldiers in the palace and then heal with Yurene or go with her to the tour and help um, give self-defense lessons to the girls. When Hassar tells them that Nesrin and Sartak are gonna be gone even longer, Yurene feels really guilty because she's like, yes. I get to keep Kale to myself, but she knows that like technically he's still dating Nesrin, so it's getting messy. They find out that there were in fact attacks in Skull's Bay, which is so upsetting to Kale because Dorian and Aelin were spotted using their magic. So there's like confirmation that the two of them were there and he's like, great, wonderful. I'm the idiot who put my two best friends in harm's way trying to save them. On top of that, reports are coming in that now Aelin is burning Ella away as she like travels along the coast to show off her power and like try to force people into joining her army. And Kale is like, there's no no way she would do that, you're wrong. But then Hassar like backs him into a corner and is like, would you swear on Yurene's life that Aelin wouldn't use those kind of tactics to get people to join her? And Kale can't do it. Kashin comes to see him again that night and I think he actually like lockpicks the door and sneaks inside, which is very funny. But he tells Kale that the only reason why his siblings are ganging up on him is because Sartok is starting to take the threat more seriously. And his siblings are clearly worried that if he convinces his dad, they'll all be forced to fight. Kashin also tells him that Rolf ordered a huge number of fire lances for Aelin's armada, which is a big deal and really expensive weaponry that they're ordering from the southern continent. So of course the siblings left that out because that was going to make Aelin look good. In the desert, Falcon is like slowly recovering. Remember he got really rickety wrecked by that spider attack. So they're waiting on him to get better because Haloon is insisting that the three of them go together if they're going to keep looking for the spiders. So instead of more fighting, we get some scenes of Sartok taking Nessern around while he visits the different clans and he doesn't want her to like stay behind him. She tries very much to be like, ah yes, I'm just visiting, I'm his friend, um, I'm not in the way. And he's like, no, no, come and talk to them. And he keeps her like at his side and wants her to get to know everybody too. Nesserin is asked to tell her own stories one night around the fire, but she says she doesn't really have any, but she's happy to sing for them. And that is a talent that we didn't know she had. So she sings a couple songs and everybody's really enjoying it. Sartog is like, girl, you're so fine. I am in love with you. And he's like looking at her and just like flirty smiling. And she doesn't look away. I can't with the two of them. The pining of them is like Regency era pining. Okay, it's so good. We even get the moment where like Sartok tells her, you know, there's still a lot going on out here. And Nestrin is like, you're right. I think we should stay longer. I'm going to extend our stay three weeks. And Sartok's like, a great deal can happen in three weeks. And Nesrin's like, yes, yes, I know. I'm very excited to find out what. I can't. I can't. We also find out about a ruck that lost its rider. And Bort is like, Nesrin, you should ride the ruck. You should see if he wants you to be his rider. And Nesrin's like, how can I do that to him when I'm going to be leaving soon? Because at this point, she's still like, I'm going back with Kale. I'm technically here with Kale. I have to go home with him. Do you, girl? Do you? Then we get a scene where a group of like random riders from another clan, I think they're described as being like one of the more like, um, like aggressive clans, like the fighting ones, they come over and like surprise Bort and Nesrin and Sartok. And one of the boys named Yaron like gets off his ruck and starts immediately like squaring up with Bort and they're like fighting back and forth and snipping at each other. He wants to know what's going on with the spiders because the different scouts have been like telling each other everything and they know that Sartok's like searching for the spiders and looking for them. And Sartok's like, don't worry about it. I've got it under control. And Yaron definitely doesn't believe leave him. But Sartok is the prince, even if he acts like he's not the prince amongst the Ruck Riders. So he listens and he leaves. And then Nesrin is like, um, who was that guy, Bort? Like, you seemed really mad at him. And Bort's like, yeah, he's the worst. Also, he's my fiance. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Thank you.
Elodie and Lorcan are now making their way to the marshes, trying to meet up with Aelin there. We get confirmation that Lorcan is kind of guided by basically the god of death, which is very interesting because Elodie is sort of maybe guided by like the god of witches. And you know who happens to be a couple in the pantheon? That's right. They're two gods. Excuse me? They have a nice talk about how Lorcan joined Maeve because he thought he loved her and he wanted to work for her, but he knows that she doesn't really love him and he's starting to like kind of second guess a few things. And Elodie tells him that she thinks that love should make you happy and it should be easy. Like you shouldn't have to like trick yourself into it or think about it too hard. He says, well, I don't mind, you know, being around you. And Elodie's like, I don't mind being around you either. If my friends win this war, I'm gonna offer you protection in Paranth and you can come stay there with me. And Lorcan's like, girl, I know you're a human, but you need to know what that's gonna look like because if I leave Maeve and come live with you, like I'll be disgraced and it'll make your reputation look bad. And like, we can't be doing that. She kisses him anyway, like just a quick little peck and says, even if you go back to Maeve, if it's 10 years later and you change your mind, you have a place with me, I'll take you in. That like snaps something in him and he's like, oh my God, am I in love with the human girl? Yes, you big giant idiot, of course you are. So he like pounces on her a little bit, but he's really gentle with her, which is again, so funny because remember they have like a three foot difference in height. So he is like this giant hulking, like basically the Hulk of a man. And she's teeny tiny little fairy lady, but she's a human. And he just like pounces on her and they kiss. But before anything else can happen, and she definitely wants more to happen before they can do anything else, demons attack yet again. We go abruptly back to Tower of Dawn. So best of luck to Lorcan and Elodie. I, I hope they're gonna make it. After what he learned about Aelin ordering the fire lances, Kale like forces his way into a council meeting amongst Uris and uh, the foreign trade advisor. And he basically is like, how much were the fire lances that we ordered? Ah, a ridiculously expensive number. I'd like to double it. We want twice as many. And he pays for it with the gold and trinkets that he already brought from Aelin that originally Uris had denied. He's trying to show how lucrative the war could be. And obviously Uris knows that, but he still doesn't want to get involved. So he kicks Kale out and says that if the guards let him ever interrupt a meeting again, they'll be in a lot of trouble. It's another really upsetting moment for Kale because he's still in his chair in this moment. And so when, um, I think it's Shin, I think it's the soldier that likes him, that they have like that bond because Shin only has one hand. I think it's him and he has to like, you know, forcibly roll Kale out of the room. And those moments are like the worst for Kale because he can't fight back. He feels like he can't fight back. When Yurin comes to heal him for their normal session, he's still grumpy. And even though he can tell he's doing it out of like spite because he's angry, he's so angry he can't stop himself. So he just like picks at her and picks at her until they get into a fight. He takes it too far though. And he says that at least Aelin goes after her enemies. Yurin doesn't do anything but hide from them, which is like stupidly offensive given everything she's been through. And he knows it immediately. And he's like, oh my God, too far. I went too far. Oh no. So he gets up and she's leaving the room and he walks to her and she's so surprised that he's taking steps that she's like frozen. And he basically stumbles into her like at the wall and they start making out. The next day after his training session with the soldiers, she comes to see him and they kiss again in the courtyard and then they get caught and they're both like, oh, I can't believe we got caught. And I'm like, you guys are literally in the courtyard. This palace is full of spies. Like you shouldn't have even kissed in the bedroom, you idiots. This makes Yurin really nervous. And so she's like, we have to knock it off and be careful because I don't want to lose my job or my respect in the palace. And Kale agrees because he doesn't want to get her hurt, obviously. And also he's cheating on Nesrin and he feels a little guilty about that. But also he really likes Yurin. So he's probably going to keep doing it. Warning you now. Also, Yurin convinced Hassar to take them out to the Oasis, which remember is like maybe where that secret library of knowledge is going to be hidden. So they're all going out there for her birthday very soon. <music> 
So Aelin's gang reaches the marshes and they start the journey off the boat into the actual marshland to get to the temple. It's going to be very dangerous because there are lots of creatures lurking in the water. Manon tells Aelin that her necklace, the Eye of Elena necklace, and that symbol, which is basically like, it's like an oval and then a circle and then I think there's a line through it, which is why they think it's an eye shape. Um, but Manon explains that to the witches, it's actually like the symbol of the goddess. So it's like the maiden mother crone energy of this world. She shares the story about the war and how the Crokins curse the Iron Teeth and all of that, which Aelin and her group didn't know fully. So Aelin's even more upset with Elena now because she's just keeping more secrets. Gavriel and Fenris express some concern to Rowan about feeling like Aelin and Manon are being like pushed into this place and they feel like the gods are like at play kind of using them as puppets. They want Rowan to take Aelin and run but he's like no I can't do that like this is what she needs to do. It takes a whole week for Sartok and Haloon to like get a plan together for them to go attacking the spiders again because it's just getting worse. Now the spiders are starting to kidnap like the baby rooks and stuff and they're rare so that's really bad. Bort wants to go with Sartok, Falcon, and Nesrin but they tell her no because she's too young and it's too dangerous. While they travel, Nesrin asks him why he's never married and Sartok says that it's because he's never been like genuinely attached to anybody, like they've never gotten close enough for him to be happy with them. And also no one has ever liked Kadara and that's like his most important relationship. So he's like, whoever I'm gonna marry has to get along with her too. And I would like to remind everybody that he let Nesrin ride Kadara alone. Are you kidding me right now? He also tells her that Bort and Yaron are engaged because they're both like crazy reckless and they get in trouble with their clans a lot for being like kind of unhinged and insane in battle. Uh, they have like these different competition games that they play to like prove who's the best rider and stuff and they both keep besting each other by like being more and more crazy each year. So fighting for them is kind of like a love language and he says he doesn't understand it but he thinks Bort is actually secretly happy. She's also starting to acknowledge how hard it's going to be for her to leave the Ruck Riders because she's starting to get attached to all of them. They get to the area where they're going to be saving the hatchlings. They see one of them and they go down to investigate and end up getting caught in the webs because it was a trap. So they crash land. Sartok ends up like grabbing Nesserin, even though I think she's behind him. Like I think she's holding on to him from behind and he ends up like turning and grabbing her and like cushioning the like fall with his body. I can't with him. Kadara is tangled up but they get to her and free her and then Sartok has to make her leave them because the spiders are attacking. They end up running further into like the mountain pass area trying to escape. While traveling in the marshes, Manon asks Dorian why he's not more curious about the keys because now they know that either Aelin or Dorian can use them. And he says that he doesn't want that kind of power because he's afraid of what he'll do with it, which is kind of funny because Aelin's already expressed that too, where she said before, like, if I take revenge, like, I'm never gonna stop killing people. I'm mad at everybody. Dorian feels the same way, but he doesn't trust himself to, like, check it. Which me and Manon, you know, we think that's super hot. Manon and Aelin also bond over their sword names. And remember, Manon's is called Wind Cleaver and Aelin's is called Goldrin. So Manon's like, mm, my name is better than yours. And Aelin's like, yeah, it is. Even though Lorcan knows that it's going to put him and Elodie in danger, he is like over here in the marshes watching the army fly in and Rowan and Aelin's group is over here. Lorcan sends his power because he knows that they've got to be close enough to hear it. And sure enough, Rowan is like, whoa, did everybody sense that? And Gabriel and Fenris are like, yes, and we would like to murder him. And Rowan's like, we can't. That was a warning. And then they see the freaking Ilkin army coming over the marshes to attack them. Adian is starting to like vocally question Aelin more and more about the fact that she doesn't consult them and she just makes all these decisions, ignoring the fact that they're like trained warriors. So Rowan is like, knock it off. And then they kind of get together and make a battle plan. We get a moment of Rowan explaining to Dory and how he should best use his magic to keep himself from being drained because they don't want him taken again. And Dorian is like, I am never gonna be Erwin's prisoner 
ever again. Absolutely not. And Manon like looks at him and gently is like, if it comes to that, I'll just kill you before they take you. And Aelin is like, you are, what? No. And Dorian is like, thank you. I appreciate it. Aelin still sends out the first shot as like a warning to the army. She basically like infernos herself again. And it is such an aggressive display of power that she wipes out like over half the army in one go. Lorcan is rushing to the battle with Elodie and he sees that happening and like seconds before they get blasted with the fire he throws himself on top of Elodie and like puts a shield around them to keep them safe. In Tower of Dawn we're going out to the oasis for uh, Yurene's birthday. We get a cute moment of Kale and Yurene riding the horses together and racing through the desert. Then we go right back to the battle when Lorcan and Elodie like stand up and she's like, oh my god, was that Aelin? And he's like, yeah, we should go say hi. As they start to walk, Gavriel and Fenris break out of the tree line and like brutally attack him because of the Blood Oath orders. Elodie freaks out and is like watching him fight and he's doing pretty good, but because of how quickly he had to throw up the shield, he used a lot of his magic, so he's super weak. He's gonna be killed by Fenris. Like Fenris is sneaking up behind him to rip out his spine and Elodie is like, no! And she throws herself in the way and Fenris ends up biting her arm instead. Lorcan throws up a another shield and then goes absolutely like unhinged level of feral over the fact that she's been hurt because it's really bad like Fenris took a chunk out of her arm there's bone showing and it's broken bone it's not looking good she's dying and Gabriel and Fenris are on the other side of the shield Fenris is sick like he is so upset that he did that he did not mean to he just couldn't pull back in time to keep from biting her because he was like lunging to attack Lorcan Gavriel is like, if you close the shield, I can heal her, okay? She doesn't have to die. I can save her, just lower the shield. Obviously, if he lowers it though, they're gonna kill him. And because now again, he's thrown up another shield and it's so strong, he's got no more magic. So he's gonna be just fighting with his strength alone and that's not gonna be enough against the two of them. But he doesn't want Elodie to die. So he looks down at her all gentle and soft and he's like, I wanted to go to Paranth with you. And then he starts fighting Fenris while Gavriel heals Elodie. Thankfully though, before it can get really bad with him and Fenris fighting, Rowan shows up and is like, Lorcan and Elodie are both under Aelin's protection and if you hurt them, it's an act of war. And Fenris and Gavriel are like, understood chief, we're good. We don't have to hurt him anymore. This whole moment ends up leading to an obvious reunion between Aelin and Elodie and it is so sweet. Aelin can only say she's sorry at first and then she tells her about her mother and she says that her last words to her were tell my Elodie that I love her very much. Fenris also is devastated that he hurt Elodie but more importantly he's upset that he disappointed Aelin and that's gonna be so important later but I just want you to know that already he's trying to be good and make a good impression on her and get her to like him because he wants to be in her court more than anything else. So Elodie gives Aelin the word key and tells her everything about Caltaine and that's another whole situation because Dorian comes over and he's like, you saw Caltaine? Like, she gave that to you? And that becomes like a big emotional thing for specifically Dorian and Aelin because obviously they hated Caltaine, but then they find out everything that happened to her. They're like, damn, she was so much stronger than we thought she was. Like, how cool that she's helped us now and now we have a second word key. Aelin plans on bringing Elodie home with her and tells Manon that she claims her from the witches. Manon doesn't really fight it, but also she does feel a lot of protection for Elodie and she wants to know she's safe. So it's kind of like a joking fight between Aelin and Manon of who will take care of Elodie. Rowan can see the difference of Lorcan now that he's with Elodie and he's like, this is interesting. I did not know you could be this nice. Also, it's a huge deal that Lorcan didn't just take the key because that was one of the reasons why he came back over here to this continent. Like he was, he was looking for the word keys and he's been traveling with Elodie while she had one and he never took it from her. And when Rowan is like, why didn't you take it? Lorcan just goes, it wasn't mine to take. And it's like, oh, okay, but you were gonna steal it from Aelin? Sure. 
Dorian is also now starting to think that the gods are guiding them together because remember he's kind of connected to the god of truth through Gavin and then Aelin's connected to Mala and Deanna kind of. Aelin then goes back to the temple and finally opens that chest expecting to find the lock but instead they find a mirror and it's got the eye of Elena on like either side of it so they're like great surprise witch mirror what does it mean? This is when Manon tells them about the witch towers that the king had made with Erewhon and the fact that they're basically like giant laser beams. So that's gonna be fun to fight against. They travel back to the coast with the witch mirror in tow. Everyone is exhausted at this point and several of them are hurt or magically drained. When they get to the shore, they're shocked to see a hundred ships waiting off the coast and everybody is like oh my god it's Maeve and Maeve's army we're in danger but Aelin is like no no problem let's go say hi we should go talk to them in his panic about keeping Elodie safe Lorcan sends out like a flare of magic and everybody kind of looks at him and is like broski relax Manon gets really annoyed when he does this and like with his like overprotective you know fey instincts that are happening he's starting to like growl at people when they get too close to her because she's still slightly injured and Manon is like you need to cool it or I'll kill you and Elodie puts her hand on Lorcan's arm and goes I choose this Manon and Manon's like ew we will talk about your disgusting taste in men later when they get down to the ships though it's actually just freaking Ansel of Briarcliff Things are obviously touchy between Manon and Ansel because remember Ansel's family lives in the Western Waste and then the Witch Kingdom is also on the Western Waste so they're technically neighbors like they don't literally share territory it's just the same stretch of land. But Ansel is like I'm not here to fight with the witches I'm here to repay the life debt that I owe to Selena Sardothian who's actually freaking Aelin. So yeah, Ansel destroyed that army that was attacking the coast and then basically stole all their ships and all their men and brought them to be given to Aelin. Things are starting to get spicy that night as everybody's like hanging out and getting to know each other between Aiden and Lysandra, but they decide that they kind of just want to stay friends. She has a moment where she says to him, you know, I really like spending time with you. I'm glad that you don't seem to like be upset with me. I know my history is unappealing. And Aiden's like, don't ever talk about yourself like that again. You are perfect to me. You're a goddess. I'm obsessed with you. Be quiet. Back to Tower of Dawn. The royals reach the oasis. And everybody basically like jumps in the pool and starts skinny dipping and Yureen and Kale are like, oh, oh no, we don't want to do that. And they sneak away because they want to like scope out the place and get the information that they need. They find a fey burial site. This is surprising because Kale didn't think the fey settled anywhere but in the north. I personally love this because the camps where Sartok takes Nesserin are like in the Windhaven Mountains. And then in Akatar, the Illyrians live in the Windhaven camps. And I personally headcanon that these two groups of people are connected. Okay, the Southern Continent Fey people are connected to the Illyrians because I know damn well that the Bat Boys are more than just slightly tan. This is also crazy because they're looking at basically like carvings on the wall and history and given what we now know in CC3, it just once again confirms that all these groups of Fae are connected because all of their architecture is really similar. So they start to think that the Fae that settled in the south must have like co-inhabited with the humans and had like half fey children that then led to like the human offspring as the years went on and that is why there are so many healers from the south that's kind of the magic that they were given from this group of fey that's pretty much all they learn but they decide that when they get back they're going to talk to hephasia because they're like maybe if the fey were connected to the tour that's where they put the secret knowledge and she will know something about the vog so they go back to the rest of the party and have to pretend like everything's fine and they're having a great time and they don't like desperately want to go home hussar is unfortunately in a mood and even though it's yurene's birthday dinner she's basically mean to everybody she starts talking about how maybe if aelin would come and marry one of their brothers then they could maybe join the war because that would be worth it and kale has to be like yeah actually she's already in engaged uh to Prince Rowan Whitethorn so like 
screw off. Then Hassar starts poking fun at Kashin and Yurin. He says that they should go ahead and get married and Kale is like shut up like no she's not marrying him because Hassar at that point is just trying to be cruel so she's like tempting Yurin by being like if you marry him I bet that would make my dad want to fight your war. They kind of relax a little bit and then Hassar out of nowhere makes like a really cruel remark about the fact that Kale's in a wheelchair and Yurin snaps and pushes her backwards into the pool like chair and all she just goes flying backwards into the pool. Thankfully her girlfriend and Kashin start laughing the second Hussar like pops out of the water. So then Hussar starts laughing and Yurin is like, thank you, every god above. I'm not gonna die today because she absolutely thought Hussar is gonna kill me right now on sight. Kale's super upset that she would be willing to risk something like that for him because she absolutely could have almost died. They still end up sharing a tent though. And they talk about Aelin and Nesserin. Yurin's trying to figure out if he still has feelings for either one of them. He makes it clear that he does not, and he knows he's gonna need to break things off with Nestor and he's just waiting to do it in person. Then he gives her a locket for her birthday. He tells her that he wants her to keep whatever it is that she keeps hidden in her pocket inside the locket to keep it safe. That is such a wild detail because the whole time we've been in Yurin's point of view, she reaches into her pocket and touches the note from Aelin, okay? Obviously, Kale doesn't know what it is, and we are just kind of like, that's probably what it is, right? It's the note from Aelin. It is. So he's given her a gift to hold that secret note without knowing it's from Aelin too. I simply cannot. Then they hook up. I'm so sorry, Nesrin. After the hookup, Yurin tells him that the thing she keeps in her pocket is the note from the woman who helped her get to the Southern Continent in the first place. She tells him what the note says, but she doesn't let him look at it and she doesn't know the girl's name. So she can't even tell him, oh, it was Selena. She has no idea who it was. He says he doesn't need to see the note. He's just thankful for whoever the woman was. Meanwhile, while this is happening and they're having a great evening together, freaking Sartok and Nesserin are running for their lives through the mountain pass. They get trapped in a rock slide and Sartok can't get out. Nesserin is like pulling him and he's stuck, okay? He's too broad chested. He can't get through the gap. He knows he's gonna die, right? So his face just like slips into like an expression of calm and peacefulness because he doesn't want her to be afraid and he tells her that he loved her from the moment he started hearing stories about her before they even met. He says, I wish we'd had time. And then he gets snickety snatched by the spiders and yeeted away from her. So Nesrin is devastated, right? She's crying, she's got Falcon in her pocket. He's still turned into a little mouse and he doesn't really know what's going on, but he's anxious. Then she realizes in her like haze of emotions that the spiders were talking about keeping him alive for something. So she's like, wait a second. And she goes back and gets herself kidnapped and ends up like in the spider's lair with Sartok who is still breathing. Falcon is still a mouse, as I said, so he starts carefully like chewing through the webs to get her out. While he's doing that, one of the spiders comes in and talks to her and says that they're waiting for the queen of the Vogue to arrive. Drum roll, it's freaking Maeve. The whole Elaine group back in Empire of Storms decides that they're gonna sail to Terrasin now that they have enough people to go to the Lords and be like, screw you guys, I brought your armies. Ansel also confirms that it was Maeve setting those fires, so she was blaming it on Aelin, but it was always Maeve. Ansel also tells Aelin that she came to get her out of the prison because when she found out she'd been captured, she was like, no, 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 I owe her a life debt, I'll go get her. But thankfully, when she got there, that was the day Dorian had already taken Aelin out. Even though the others are kind of annoyed that Aelin does this like scheming, plotting stuff behind their backs, Rowan is like, this is so hot. My wife is so damn hot. I love that she lies to me. I think it's, it's beautiful. is also a little hot and bothered he goes and sees Manon and they finally hook up then like all of a sudden he like pulls back from her and is like hey by the way bestie um I know that the bloodhound was lying Astrin's not dead I could like smell the lie when it was talking I guess because he's part Vogue that's never like fully confirmed 
but I think that's what happened there. It's a crime that this scene with Dorian and Manon, which is their like first official like full hookup scene, is right after the scene with Kale and Yareen. Because when you read the Kale and Yareen scene, you're like, oh, he's so sweet and strong. What a good scene. That was so nice. And then you get to the Dorian one and you're like, Kale who? I don't remember Kale. I don't remember Rowan. I don't remember my own name. Dorian, supremacy, live, laugh, love, Dorian. Like even Manon is just like weak in the knees because normally men are scared of her. So she's in control constantly. She's the one leading things and initiating. And Dorian is having none of that. He's like, no, no, I'm using my phantom hands to restrain you to the bed. Excuse me? Manon doesn't even know what to do with herself. She's out of body experience. He tells her that he's wanted her from the moment they met in the forest. And he's changed his mind about where he stands on the line between like killing for fun and killing because he has to. And when he sees her grandma, it's on sight and he will enjoy every second of it. When they're done and they're like getting dressed and everything, Manon's like, so are we good now? Like, are you done with me? And Dorian's like, <laughs> not even close. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. I know I said the Rowan and Aelin scene is my favorite, but this Dorian and Manon scene... Man, I love him. On the boat with them, Elodie and Lorcan also stay up, but they are just like talking and whispering to each other and being cute. He's touched that she like chose him and wants to stay with him and is willing to fight for him, but also he's lying a little bit about a lot of things. So in the morning, he's like, Elodie, we really need to talk. He gets cut off though by the sailors freaking out and raising the alarm because Maeve's fleet is surrounding them. The team knows that Maeve is gonna give Aelin until the next morning to surrender so that everybody can see it happen properly. When Aelin goes to bed, she is so defeated and so like accepting of her fate because this is kind of the moment where she decides, all right, I'm gonna die. And we're gonna get into that more in a little bit, but this is when she starts feeling that way. So everybody's like, what do we do? What's the plan? And she's like, I don't know, I'm going to bed. Rowan can't stand to see her so upset, so he secretly flies over to the fleets and goes and visits each one of his cousins because remember, the White Thorns fight for Maeve. They're in her army and a lot of them are like generals and stuff. So he goes ship to ship and tells each of his cousins like the truth about Aelin and the truth about his love for her and what she wants for the world. And each one of them is like, okay, Rowan, will consider it because he wants them to like turn and fight for them instead. And instead of, you know, killing him or calling the alarm or anything, each one of them is just like, we will consider it. Like, let us think about it. In the spider cave, Nesrin is like, what the frick do you mean? Maeve is queen of the Valg. No, she's not. She's queen of the Fae. And the spider's like, mm -mm, I know more than you. So Nesrin tricks it into telling her the whole story. We learn about three powerful dark kings that's conquered all the worlds. This is Erwin and his two brothers. All three of them loved the same dark queen, which is Maeve. She married the oldest brother, but she was never satisfied. So she started trying to figure out how she could leave him and go to a different world. That's how she came over to the throne of glass world. She also brought her spiders. So that's where they came from. The husband was so angry that he made the three word keys so that him and his brothers could go world to world looking for Maeve and conquering as they went. Meanwhile, Maeve settled in with Mab and Mora, the actual fae queens, and using her mind powers, uh-huh, she got into their heads and convinced them they had a sister. And then slowly but surely, she got into the whole world's heads and changed the histories so that people believed there'd always been three of the fae sisters. The kings ended up coming to the world and attacking, but they didn't recognize Maeve in her fae body. So she was able to beat them and take the keys for herself. Two of the brothers were sent away, but Erwin obviously stayed behind. And that's when Brandon came and took the keys from Maeve because he didn't trust her. And this led, you know, to Erwin getting locked up and all of that. Maeve is afraid of Brandon's wildfire, just like all of the Vogs. So that's why they're so afraid of Aelin too. That's why Maeve built her kingdom in the water, out of stone, so that fire couldn't hurt it. A spider then comes in and is like, help, there's Ruck Riders coming. So the spider watching Nesrin and Sartok leaves for a second, 
Falcon quickly like gets out of his restraints, turns into a spider, and then like frees Sartok and Nesrin so they can all run. Sartok is really hurt though, so even though he's awake and moving, he's moving pretty slowly. They end up kind of getting cornered again and using flaming arrows now that they know that the spiders and the Volg are all afraid of fire, they fire flaming arrows at them and that works. It gets really bad though and they get like attacked by even more spiders and Falcon is like, I'm gonna stay and I'm gonna fight them in this form. I need you to go because someone has to find my niece. Yes, that's right. Falcon has a niece who may or may not be a shapeshifter that he accidentally left behind in Rifthold and has been looking for this whole time. He tells Nesrin if she's alive and Nesrin can find her, he leaves everything to her. Nesrin is obviously like, oh my god, I think that your niece is Lysandra, but he jumps into the fighting before she can tell him that. It looks like they are screwed, and then all of a sudden the rucks arrive, and Sartog looks at Nesrin and he's like, don't fear the drop, just relax, let yourself go live. And she's like, what are you talking about? And then Bort's ruck swoops down and like picks them up in her claws. <laughs> So yeah, Bort came with Euron and they burned down the whole like spider stronghold. So it looks like that issue, at least for right now in that part of the desert is gonna be handled. Back on the boats with the Maeve situation, in the morning, Dorian is like, I'm done waiting around. And he grabs Aelin and Manon and takes them down to where they've been keeping the mirror. And is like, y'all need to use this damn thing because maybe it will tell us what we need to know. So the girls join hands and touch the mirror and disappear. Adian gets so mad that he just decks Dorian on sight. I'll never forgive him for that. It's ridiculous. Rowan even is like, all right, I'm not also gonna hit Dorian because that was a good punch and he got what he deserved. So now they have to fight with or without Aelin. That's great. Lorcan agrees to fight with them only if they will get Elodie off the boats and leave her on shore so she's not part of the fighting. Maeve sends a messenger asking for Aelin's surrender. Rowan says, Aelin is not here. Could we please just float by each other and not attack since Aelin's not here? The messenger goes back, tells Maeve that, and then arrows like shoot on them and the attack begins. At the Oasis, Kale and Yurene leave early the next morning with just like a note left for Hussar and the other royals saying that they need to go back to the palace. When they get there, Kale and Nesserin's rooms have been completely destroyed. The only thing they didn't take was the single scroll that they hid in the boot a long time ago. So Kale wants Yurene to go back to the tour because he thinks she'll be safest there, but also he's realized that he desperately needs to tell Nesrin the truth, so he wants to wait there so that he can talk to her right when she gets home. So Yurene goes to the tour and she talks to Hephaestia about the scrolls and basically tells her everything. Turns out that Hephaestia does in fact have a locked trunk of Vogue scrolls, but no one before her has ever used them and no one can read them and she thought they weren't for human eyes like she thought they were evil so this kind of confirms that the Fae and the Volg are connected on both continents and there's history there. Yurene obviously wants to take them because she knows that Kale has somebody, Aelin, that can read them but Hephaestia is a little nervous and she's like you're gonna have to let me think about it because I don't think these are supposed to be opened and it scares me. Yurene has a truly beautiful moment where she spends some time in the like bath chamber room which is like a really cool location in the tour. It's kind of like the whole idea of like a womb space for the healers so it's like connected to the goddess of healing and it's like being with her in like a child and mother kind of way and all of the healers leave like little bells when they, I think when they graduate the tour either when they graduate or when they like join the tour they put a bell in the room and so the water trickles down and makes the bells jingle and it's like really sweet she finds in that special room a freaking bell with an ancestor's name on it so she knows confirmed at some point there were towers women over in the southern continent in the beginning learning that magic and then her and her mom ended up over in the north Aelin and Manon went into the mirror and they are in fact shown visions of the past. They see Elena using the eye to lock up Erwin in the tomb. Gavin acted as a distraction fighting Erwin while she was doing that, so now he's dying. Turns out the eye of Elena's stone that Aelin wears is actually a mirror 
in this moment, the gods, including Elena's own mother, Mala, all show up and are livid with her because they're like, you idiot, you didn't use them correctly. Why did you waste the strength of them to lock him up? This was so stupid. You were supposed to send him and us home. She begs them not to release him again because she doesn't have the strength to fix everything right now. And she's like, what do we do differently next time? And they're like, well, next time you'll have to sacrifice someone from your own bloodline and basically have them repeat this whole story over again and finally send us home correctly. They also learn that this aforementioned descendant is gonna have to give up every single drop of their life force in order to forge the lock and make the keys work. Gavin can't hear what's being said. He just can hear Elena talking. He can't see the gods that she's talking to. So when she gets out of that conversation, he's like, what did you promise them? And she's like, we can talk about it tomorrow. Then we see Nehemia visiting the temple and talking to Elena for the first time. She wanted to be the one to give up her life to save the world, but Elena had to explain that it had to be someone from Brandon and her bloodline. She tells her though about Aelin and Dorian and leads her over to the palace so she can go be connected with them. Turns out Nehemia knew all along that she was gonna die. That was like her role in the story and she had accepted it because she wanted the better world that they were all working towards. I think if we're looking at it like the past is repeating itself, Nehemia is representing all of Gavin and Elena's friends that they sacrificed in the final battle so that they could get away from camp and go after Erewhon themselves. After her moment in the bath, Yurina's like, I'm a badass bitch and I can handle this. So she storms over to Kale the next day and is like, get on your stomach. We are freaking ending this today. Kale is nervous. And he's like, if you do too much, it will kill you. And she's like, I'm strong enough, roll over. It's a really bad struggle, but she freaking does it. He's fully healed. We get to see that one of the things that was really holding Kale back mentally, because SJM always connects the two, um, was the fact that he left Dorian behind. So that was like a big thing for him that he couldn't let go of that guilt. This whole moment leads to Yurin and Kale saying I love you for the first time. He asks her to join him on the ship and go home with him and she says yes. The fight starts between Maeve and Aelin's court and it is really bad. Lysandra fights as a sea dragon. She's only attacking the ships that Rowan told her to attack so she's leaving his cousin's boats alone. All of a sudden some of Maeve's ships like pull ahead a little bit and they've all been flying like Maeve's banner and the house banners. And all of a sudden, the Whitethorn ships lower Maeve's banner and turn on Maeve's ships and start freaking fighting for Aelin. Every single one of Rowan's cousins joins the fight. Rowan is so touched. He's like, oh my God, I love my family. This is the best day of my life. Open fire. And they start just like going ham on Maeve's fleet. Lorcan, the only one with foresight, is like, um... Maeve is not on those ships and then he realizes that she's heading towards the freaking beach where he left Elodie behind. So he freaking jumps ship and is like, give me a rowboat, I'm going ashore. Sartok and Nesserin are both recovering. Nesserin ends up telling the entire clan the whole story about Maeve and Erewhon and everything. They do believe her, but it's a lot to take in, so they decide they're gonna have their own little council meeting and decide if they're gonna join her or not. She also tells Falcon about Lysandra and she's like, you need to come with me because I'm 99% sure that that's your family member. Right as the council like concludes and they call Sartog and Nesrin back to tell them what they've decided, she gets a message from Kale telling her to frantically come home immediately because he needs her. All right, now we've reached the awful stretch of time where we have to talk about the final eight chapters of Empire of Storms. It's really bad. I'm warning you now. Okay guys, this is the third and final lighting change. I'm sorry. <laughs> This video has gotten away from me and now it is several hours later. I had to do a meeting with my friend and here we are. We're filming the ending. <laughs> Inside the mirror, Aelin and Manon also see Elena's fight with her dad. This was not only just about what she'd done with the keys and like locking Erewhon away, but also the fact that she gave up her immortal life and like died a human to be with Gavin. They also watch Brannon making the places to hide the word keys and then like labeling the room and leaving all the markings in the tomb for the descendant to find one day. He also like died in fire like to give his soul up to Mala to be with her for all of eternity. 
It was very emo of him, but nice. He's, he's with his wife, lady. I, they weren't married. I don't know. Also, the last croaking queen, who was also named Rhiannon, which was Manon's sister's name, she looks just like Manon, like same face. It freaks both of them out. But she helped, which is just another connection, like uniting Manon and Aelin. Then Elena appears and she apologizes to Aelin about what's happened and what's coming for her. Aelin realizes that it was Elena who saved her the night when she jumped into the river and then ended up on the riverbank. The queen who was promised is not about the world and what she was gonna do for her friends, but it's about the gods and the promise that Elena made to them to sacrifice a descendant later on. Yeah, it's true. Elena's like, I saw you there on the riverbank and you were so small and I couldn't help saving you. And then she convinced Arabin to come and find her, even though she knew what was gonna happen and how she was gonna grow up. She wanted her to at least have the chance to live and possibly find Rowan and let all of that unfold. And because she did that, the gods got even more upset with her and they took away basically like her immortal life in the afterworld. So she will never get to see Gavin or her family again once her job is done. I apologize for how loud my sons are being. They're having like battle royale back and forth across the living room. They of course won't go upstairs. They're just running back and forth. So if you hear any banging or scratching, that's what it is. That's what it is. Elena then says that the mirror's power is draining and she's gonna have to leave them soon, but she agrees to tell them everything they need to know. We don't get to see it though on page. Aelin and Manon then leave the mirror and end up on the bank where Elodie has been captured by Maeve's soldiers. The battle on the water is still raging and it is once again not looking good. Adian orders Lysandra, because he technically outranks her in the court system, to run away if it gets to the point where she's gonna die and she doesn't want to. Also they like snuggle up on each other again so they're like they're getting real close. Dorian is using his magic and fighting for his life. He is like this close to just going down, like it's not looking good for our boy. And then the freaking 13 arrive. Abraxas went and got them and brought them back to help. After the battle, because once the 13 arrive, it's like slim pickings, it's so quick and easy, that all winds down. And Dorian is like, hey guys, something's wrong. And he can sense that Manon and Aelin are off on the shore where they left Elodie, and then Maeve is also there. He's like, I can feel the Vogue power. We have to go to shore quickly. But they are like way out in the water, okay? They're like past the, um, you remember the, how Skulls Bay is like the bay itself, and then there's like the shipbreaker thing that her and Sam broke that one time? They're way out past shipbreaker. Like they're, they're out there. <music> Meanwhile on the beach, Aelin faces off against Maeve. Lorcan does apologize for summoning her. So now everybody knows that he did that. And Aelin's like, yes, I knew the whole time. Did you think I'm an idiot? She says she already took precautions. And Lorcan's like, so like, you're not gonna kill me on sight? What is going on? Maeve then tells Aelin that she planned this all along and she's been leaving little tests for her. So like the fires on the coast were just a way for Aelin to drain her magic so that when she faced Maeve finally, she would be weak. Still though, Aelin's like, get wrecked, homie. And she just unleashes herself against Maeve and they start fighting. Lorcan uses this moment to get free and like go to Elodie and get the guards away from her and free her. He begs her to run, but she doesn't want to leave Aelin and Manon behind. And then Maeve turns around and catches them and is like, oh, Lorcan, wonderful. Hold the girl for me and don't move. And because of the blood oath, he can't fight it. Aelin is getting weaker and weaker. And Manon at this point is sort of like orbiting the battle, trying to get over to Elodie. So Elodie starts begging Manon to help. But Maeve says that they're not fighting. And if Manon leaves her alone, there's no issues between Maeve and the witches. And so Manon's like, understood. Do what you need to do to Aelin. I'm gonna head out. Gavriel and Fenris arrive right as Aelin runs out of magic. Gavriel begs Maeve to just stop this and let them return home with her. And then when Maeve refuses, so then Gavriel changes tactics and is like, well, didn't I disappoint you? Like, didn't I come here and fail? And like, we didn't kill Lorcan. Um, so why don't you just take my life instead of Aelin's life? Just go ahead and punish me instead because he's trying to save Adian from the pain of losing Aelin. Maeve is so disgusted by him 
that she breaks the blood oath and that leaves him like without a title, without resources and like dishonored, which is really bad because remember Gabriel's whole thing is like honor and loyalty. Maeve then tells Aelin that she knew all along she would always lead her to the word keys. And she has been like orchestrating little pieces of Aelin's life the whole time. She is the reason why Rowan had his first mate, okay? So he met that girl and married her and fell in love with her and they had the kid. And then Maeve killed her and the kid so that Rowan would be weakened and be more vulnerable to being like connected to Maeve and like sucked into her little group. She basically twisted him up into the perfect little weapon so that she could dangle him in front of Aelin one day and be like, you want your mate? You have to come visit me to find him. Because yeah, Rowan and Aelin are actually mates. And the first girl that he was with, it was all a lie. Maeve faked the whole thing. This enrages Aelin because she's like, I can't believe you put him through that and it wasn't even real. Also, Aelin and Rowan have both been wondering about this and we've seen little moments that have like confirmed these things, like the fact that when they were on the ship, Rowan got in front of her and she couldn't use her magic on him. You can't hurt your mate. That's a whole thing. Maeve then taunts her by being like, the really sad thing is you were gonna have a thousand years with him. My sister's bloodline ran true. You're gonna settle into your fae form in about five years. Too bad that's not happening now. She is planning to take Aelin away and keep her like tormented and tortured so that Aelin can use the keys for Maeve. Then Maeve calls for Karen. We're gonna call him Karen. I don't know if we're supposed to say Karen. I'm gonna say Karen because I hate him. He's the evil, vile, despicable man that she brought in to replace Rowan. She says that Aelin must come with them willingly or she's also gonna take Elodie. And now remember, Elodie is like straight up a human. So she will not hold up well under torture. It's clear that Lorcan and Fenris are like seconds away from like launching themselves at Maeve and getting her to leave Aelin alone. So she orders them to stand perfectly still and do nothing. At this point, Elodie is sobbing, like just completely freaking out. Aelin turns to Manon and tells her to get Elodie out of there and take care of her. And Manon agrees. Elodie is like begging Aelin to just let her go. She's like, I'll go with you. You don't have to go alone. I'll go with you. It's okay. But Aelin refuses to let that happen. She tells Elodie she needs her to stay behind and tell Rowan the truth about everything. Then she says that she's so proud of her. She knows her mother is proud of her and she's so glad that they got to meet. Maeve then makes Aelin bow to her. Then she makes her take off her shirt and right there in the sand in front of everybody, she's like, Karen, I think 10 lashes will be enough. Count for us, Aelin. But Aelin refuses to count. So she makes Karen repeat the lashings over and over again. The only reason why Maeve stops is because Rowan and the others are getting close enough to shore that they're in danger of catching them. So Maeve is like, mm, looks like my evil plan's gotta be cut short for the day. Let's get her ready for transport. They box her up in an iron coffin, chain her with iron shackles, and put an iron mask over her face. Maeve makes Fenris come with them because she knows that he's so disgusted and she already knows he hates her and she can tell that he loves Aelin at this point. So she's like, I'm gonna make you watch, get on the boat and he has to go. But she leaves Lorcan behind and even after he says to her because of the blood oath, he like admits that he did everything for her trying to like do what she wanted and keep her safe. She says, I don't need any men beside me that think they know best. Freaking strips him of his title too, so he's not blood oathed anymore. He's in pain and Elodie's watching him and he starts like crawling through the grass towards the ship after Maeve and Elodie's like, what the is wrong with this guy? Like, I can't believe I ever kissed him. So yeah, Elodie's freaking out and crying. Manon is like, if you don't shut the fuck up, be quiet, we have to get out of here. And she's basically like dragging Elodie backwards through the sand, trying to get to a safe location because it turns out that at the very beginning of the beach scene, when Aelin brushed against Manon, she freaking gave her the word keys. So they're safe with Manon and Maeve thinks that she's taking Aelin and the word keys and getting away, but that's not what's happening. Manon has the freaking keys. Okay, 
Okay, so Aelin's gone, right? Manon has walked away from the group. Lorcan's on the beach. There's blood on the beach. Aelin's shirt is still on the beach. And Rowan shows up. He grabs Lorcan by the back of the head and puts a knife to his throat and is like, where is Aelin? Where is Aelin? Where is my wife? Lorcan's already freaking out. And when he hears that word, he's like, what? He starts sobbing, like straight up Lorcan just starts to cry. And he's like, I'm so sorry. He's freaking out internally. He's like, what did I do? I can't believe I was a part of this. His wife? What do you mean his wife? So Rowan finally lets Lorcan go because he's like, okay, I don't need to kill him. Like clearly he feels bad enough about this situation. And Elodie makes it back over to them and tells Rowan everything, confirming that Aelin is his mate. So now Rowan's like, oh good, I already thought that, but now I have confirmation. And meanwhile, Lorcan is like, his wife and his mate? Like still having a panic attack in the sand. <laughs> Rowan's obviously mad at Lorcan for sending the power that called Maeve over. But at this point, Lorcan is like, I'm gonna do whatever I need to do to get Aelin back because Rowan is my main man and I am gonna be a good friend moving forward. Also turns out Lysandra knew the whole time she knew the whole plan. Her and Aelin talked about it and made like a backup last resort plan, which was basically that Aelin would sacrifice herself, give up her life to make Maeve happy. And then Lysandra would shift into Aelin and stay in that form, marry Rowan, but have children with Adian so that they looked like Ash River heirs. Yeah, Adian is so mad and disgusted by this that he tells Lysandra to go to hell. So that's going to be a fun part of Kingdom of Ash, watching them try to navigate getting back together. It's going to take a while. So Lorcan still having a panic attack, all right, trying to decide what he wants to do. Elodie comes over to him and tells him that she hopes he dies alone and sad with no one around him and then says she's going off with Manon, get wrecked. So yes, Manon and the 13 reunite with Elodie. It's really sweet. The girls are so excited to see each other. They know Manon's half croaking. Manon expects the 13 to be kind of upset. And instead they're like, actually bestie, we love you. And we will stand by you no matter what, three finger salute. And so they're all gonna be fine. Before she goes to leave, Manon gives Dorian the word keys. And she tells him that in Aelin's place, he can use them and finish everything, you know because they're cousins. I'm never gonna let you forget that fact because once it became a revelation, it has haunted me to this day. When did Rowan and Aelin get married? You may be wondering because we just really bulldozed over Rowan, where's my wife, Whitethorn, okay? That happened and we just, we snowballed over it. They got married two days ago in secret, only with Aiden and Lysandra knowing. So Dorian was on the boat and she didn't invite him. Are you kidding me? We get a Rowan POV confirming fully that he knew all along she was his mate, but he felt so guilty about it because he really did love the first girl. And so he was like, can I have two? What's going on? He refuses to let Aelin sacrifice herself because he knows that the plan was for her to disappear and then for them to win the war anyway. And he's like, yeah, we're gonna win the war, but first I'm gonna get your ass back. And so he sends down the bond, like I'm coming for you, I'm going to find you, but he can't feel her for a response. So the battle on the water is like officially over. And then all of a sudden more boats appear. It's freaking Galan from Windland. He answered a missive from Aelin where she said, do you remember my mom? Do you remember Terrison? I fought for your people at this location. Now you need to come fight for me. Talking about when she protected the Fae over in Mistward and like defended the fortress. That was her there on his territory helping him. So he freaking shows up and says, yeah, we've never forgotten her mom. We've never forgotten Terrison. I'm ready to fight whether my parents want me to or not. Adian and Galan have a moment here where they look at each other and they're like, whoa, we look identical. We're family. This is so cool. But they try to like be cool about it to be like, oh man, bro, what's up? It's nice to see you again. <laughs> what's up, homie? And like this kind of fist bump moment, but they're definitely ready to cry. I hope you're ready to cry because from over the sand dunes comes freaking Ilias and the silent assassins. They've also come to repay a life debt for Aelin. It's one of the most amazing endings of a book 
ever. It is so incredible. Adian collapses onto his knees in shock and awe, and that's how you all should feel too. Then Lysandra transforms into Aelin and shows up, and she's like, oh my god, Galan, Ilias, it's so good to see you, like totally playing the part. Rowan is like, I'm gonna come out of my skin. She tells everybody that they're going north, and it's time to go back to Terrison and start fighting, but she tells Rowan that she's got one more secret mission for him and he needs to get something for her first before he joins them. Meaning, please God, go get Aelin. And Rowan's like, I got you, girl. I will be doing that. So Gavriel, Lorcan, and Elodie all decide that they're going with Rowan. Gavrian and Lorcan are both sure that Fenris is going to do everything he can to fight the Blood Oath and like leave them clues to lead them along to her. Adian is going to stay with Lysandra to be the one that's like guarding fake Aelin, but he is big, big mad about the horrible like weird baby plan because that just like, just think about the logistics of that, okay? Because he is and he's like, so was I going to have to like impregnate Lysandra looking like Aelin? Like, is that what was gonna have to happen? No one thought that would be awful for me? What the heck? Because the plan was to just not tell him, okay? They were gonna have to tell Rowan because Rowan was gonna be able to tell that it wasn't actually Aelin, but they just weren't gonna tell Adian. So he's like, what were you gonna do with me? Like, seduce me as Aelin? What the heck is wrong with you? Dorian is going to go north with the witches and the word keys. Manon has promised to keep him alive, and before you ask, yes, he does ride on the back of Abraxas. They're all planning to meet up in Terrison once the different jobs are over. As Rowan starts the hunt for his freaking wife, he transforms into a hawk and swears that he feels the faintest flicker, like a little glowing ember, down the mating bond. Y'all okay? Because now we have to go finish Tower of Dawn. It's not as intense, but a lot happens. So Kale tells Yureen his entire life story, starting with when he met Selena until now. Yureen starts to think that the Vogue sound an awful lot like parasites, and she wonders if she was able to get Kale's sickness out of him. Could she just get the Vogue infection out of somebody too? Like, can she just treat it like an illness? They think that this is probably why Erwin's minion is hunting her, because they know that she could do it. Hussar tells them about Aelin's fleet beating Maeve's fleet, and so as far as Kale knows, Aelin's still alive. When they make it to the tour to look at the ancient text that Hephaestia is supposed to have, Hephaestia is missing. They search the tour and end up underneath the library in like a secret tunnel system area. Hephaestia has been bound and gagged, and Duva, one of Urus's freaking kids, is just sitting there possessed by a Vogue. Yeah, it turns out she's the one that killed the sister when the sister got suspicious. Yurene was right, her healing magic is deadly to them. Maeve, on the other hand, has been hoarding healers, and the whole time we've seen Maeve, there's always like an owl perched on her chair, and an owl is a symbol of the healing goddess. I think Silva is her name. So they think maybe that owl is a healer, like turned into an owl that Maeve is keeping as like a prisoner. Duva threatens to hurt Hephaestia if Yurene doesn't agree to go with her because Erewhon for some reason wants Yurene alive for himself. But Hephaestia is having none of that, so she throws herself and her chair that she's in down the staircase, lands on Duva, and they just go tumbling down the throne room stairs. This starts a big fight between Duva and Kale. He eventually uses a mirror to like rebound the darkness magic into Duva and he's devastated because he's like, oh my god, I just killed a girl and her baby. But she was faking it and she's fine and she's not even pregnant, y'all. It's all a lie. She retaliates and hits him with a huge blast of power meant for Yurene that he like grabs Yurene and takes the brunt of it back on his freaking back. So his spine is all kinds of fricked up all over again. Duva then goes after Yurene specifically to try to get a Valg ring on her finger, and Yurene is going to kill her, like ready to just take her out, but Kale begs her not to because he's like, you will feel so bad if you kill Duva in this moment. Thankfully, this is when Nesserin and Sartok show up, and they're like, oh shit, we are a little bit too late. Hephaestia, who was really hurt, gets up and like blows sleeping powder onto Duva, so Duva goes to sleep, and thankfully the fighting is over. 
except um, Kale is dying, okay? Not only is his spine injured and he's back to being paralyzed, he is bleeding profusely and like bleeding out. There's way too much damage for Yurene to fix him on her own, but she's praying over him like begging the gods to listen to her. So her ancestors freaking show up and join around her and like give her some of their power. And then Hephaestia and every single healer in the tour make like a conga line behind her sharing power so that she can save Kale. There's a price though for the type of magic that she uses because she basically like makes a bargain and that always has a price similar to Akatar. We don't see that a whole lot in Throne of Glass, but it's that similar kind of thing. So now her magic is tied to his wound. So if she's at full strength, it's kind of like a brace for him and he can walk and he'll be totally fine. But as her magic drains, her ability to keep him healed will drain and he'll end up needing to use the chair again. In this whole moment, Kale looks over and sees Nesrin and Sartok and is like, oh, y'all hooking up or what? And Nesrin is looking at him and looking at Yurene tie her magic to his life. And she's like, um, y'all hooking up or what? And they have a silent conversation where they're basically just like, looks like we both fell in love with the people we were supposed to fall in love with. Yay. And everything is fine. That is the only time they talk about it and they don't even actually talk. He gets in no trouble. The group then takes Duva back to the palace so they can show Uris and the others the truth about what's going on. Remember, Duva is considered like the best of them, so they're all upset about this. Only the oldest brother tries to argue that maybe they're lying, and even Hussar is like, if you don't shut the fuck up. Kashin begs Yurene to go ahead and heal Duva, and she says that she'll do her best. The demon inside Duva is even worse than what was going on with Kale because this is like an actual possession and not just like lingering magic. But Yurene is able to get the monster out and it basically like comes out of Duva in like a puff of smoke that disappears in the room. And then Duva is like, yes, everything Yurene said was true because remember, just like with Dorian, Duva was in there. So she was actively fighting and she tried to keep from like her little sister being killed and all of that, but she couldn't stop it. So Uris turns to Yurene and is like, I will give you anything for saving her life. And Yurene is like, I need a favor. Later on, Cole and Yurene meet with Nesserin and Sartok in their room to kind of talk about everything that's happened. I think they've been apart at this point for like two months. All this time, the servant girl that Yurene was so suspicious of was working for Sartok. I think that's so funny because it means that Sartok and Kashin both were like, we need to keep an eye on Kale and Nesserin for very different reasons. Sartok brought a thousand ruck riders with him to join Kale and go home to fight Terrison's war. Then Hussar comes into the room and she's like, guys, why are we having war council meetings without me? I'm gonna bring as many ships as I possibly can. I'm coming with you too. Nesserin finds a two week old note from her uncle and she's like, oh my God, my family's in danger. She goes running into the city to find them on her ruck because remember now she's officially a ruck rider. How cute is that? So she flies that bird over into the town, finds her family, turns out her dad and mom and siblings all made it over to the Southern continent and they've been waiting for her. So everybody survived and it's this like adorable, wholesome reunion. And then when they go outside, freaking Sartok is just sitting there with Kadara waiting for her because he wanted to meet her family. The little cousins and her siblings are just obsessed with the birds and like Kadara's like showing off for them and like being all cute. While Sartok is just charming the pants off her dad and uncle, it's adorable. Like he is so respectful. Aunts and her mom are just like teasing her mercilessly because they're like, girl, you're in love with the prince and we knew it. Then he takes Nesserin on a walk. He tells her that after she left, he got into an argument with his dad and he basically said, look, dude, I'm going into war with the woman I love. Get wrecked. I'm taking my ruck riders. We're going, whether you want to help us or not. And Uris was like, okay, the war aside, you can't marry her. She's common born. And Sartok said, okay, well then I don't want to be heir, broski. Peace out. He started to leave and Uris went incredible. I'm making you air right now. <laughs> Nesserin is like, what do you, what do you, are you insane? What do you mean? 
Sartak says, I want to go to war with you. And then once we've like shattered Erwan and his armies, I want to come back here and stay here forever with you. We'll be emperor and empress. That's what I want. Nesrin's like, oh my god, okay, let's go to war first and then we'll see what happens after that. But they kiss and her family is there like teasing her and laughing and it's so adorable and wholesome. At the end of the book, Kale and Yareen set off on a boat with 300 tour healers with them ready to travel and help in the war. Also a huge chunk of Kashin's men because remember Kashin is like the infantry like on the ground and then Hussar is the navy with the boats and then Sartok is basically like the air force with the ruck riders. And the older brother doesn't do shit. He's just the spy master of the group. He's useless. Turns out the favor that Yareen asked Uris was save my people and he agreed. Also, Kashin and Yareen made up and they decided that they wanted to stay friends because that was like the part of their relationship that they really missed. And Sartok is heir, but he's a good, wonderful big brother, so he's not going to kill anybody because he loves his siblings, even the annoying older brother that's so obnoxious. Also, Yareen and Kale got married, which means that when Dorian is finally reunited with everybody, both of his best friends got married without him. Are you kidding me right now? Yareen tells him that she's found her courage and she doesn't think she needs her note anymore. She takes it out of the locket and she's gonna get rid of it, but Kale looks at it for the first time and recognizes the handwriting as Aelin's handwriting. He starts immediately sobbing and Yareen's like, um, babe, what's going on? And he's like, I think you should keep the note. I think somebody maybe is gonna wanna see it when we get home. And she's like, <laughs> Okay, but it is really sweet because it means that like all this stuff like red string of fate Okay, invisible string moment. They're all connected. Aelin literally sent his future wife over to the southern continent So she'd be there when Kale got there injured and she could fix him and help him then off page Kale ends up telling Yurene the whole story so he does catch her up on all of it and he doesn't just cry for no reason but on page all we see is him have a meltdown and then be like okay I'll tell you everything over dinner like he's ridiculous and then the last chapter just because all of that was so happy at the very end there's a final chapter called Fireheart it's from Aelin's point of view, and it's to remind us that she's locked up in iron shackles with an iron mask over her face in an iron coffin being woken up by Maeve so that Karen can start torturing her. Can you even believe everything that happens in those books? Because I can't. I freaking love Empire of Storms. I just feel like I love all of Throne of Glass, but as the books go on, they just progressively get better and better and better. And there's just so many moments where I'm like, oh, this is so good. Like the first half of this tandem read, I was fighting for my life because the beginning of Tower of Dawn is so boring. But then once you hit that sweet spot in the middle, it's just so good. It's so fun to read. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, don't forget to like the video and comment down below. We've got two more videos to come out in this series on Kingdom of Ash, and then I'll be ready to move on to something else. So let me know what you guys would like me to talk about. I'm open to suggestions. I don't really have a book series lined up for next, so let me know. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you guys so soon. Have a good one. Bye!